am Gabriel Bronner, and this is the Big Compute Podcast. Today's episode is a conversation with Irene Qualters. Irene has dedicated her life to high-performance computing. She spent many years at Cray in key leadership roles, and she worked at Merck, uh, leading research information services. And more recently, Irene spent nine years in leadership roles at the National Science Foundation. Last November, Irene received the HPC Wire Readers Award for Outstanding Leadership in HPC. So no surprise, our guest today is Irene Qualters, and we will talk about HPC leadership. Welcome, Irene, to the Big Compute Podcast. Thanks, Gabriel. It's a pleasure to have you here, Irene. Um, you have a unique experience um, having held leadership roles at an HPC vendor, a key user like Merck, and also in the National Science Foundation. So and I, most recently, I, I actually am uh, an associate lab director for simulation and computation at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Oh, fantastic. Yep, I should have mentioned that. Last uh, November <laughs> is when you were switching roles. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So great experience uh, coming from um, the an HPC vendor from also um, the as an HPC user at Merck and later uh, in the National Science Foundation and now at Los Alamos. So it's been a, a great combined experience and look forward to hearing your thoughts. So I wonder if I can take you to more of the beginning part uh, at your years at Cray, um, which were probably key years in the development of high performance computing and if I ask you about those years, I always wonder what comes to mind. So um, I was really fortunate uh, when I came to Cray because at that point it was a startup and um, it was a rather unique startup. You know, I was the 79th employee to join, but I was at a very early point in my career, just out of graduate school. And uh, I had the opportunity, which, which was really um, by luck more than anything, uh, to come to a group that had people who were really mid-career and mid-career in very successful careers. And among the 75 people or so, it really spanned um, almost every dimension of of high performance computing that was in place. So from mechanical to chip design, to operating systems, to compilers, to um, mathematics, um, it, that small group of 75 people really had experience, had that breadth of experience. And so, um, you know, I was really motivated just because I, I had, was coming out of school and I really wanted to continue working on challenging uh, problems that involve mathematics and computing. And it was really just fortunate that their timing was such that they were starting to build and could now take on inexperienced people like myself. So, um, so that was really career forming. And I think for those who come out of school or just starting their careers, I, I think really trying to situate yourself in a, in a place where you're going to be exposed to many different things is, uh, can really be uh, career forming at, at, as it was for me. I, as I said, I was really fortunate. That is great to hear. Those feel, you know, it's hard to imagine you that inexperience, knowing you now. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, a few years back, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> so it's great to imagine those years coming and joining um, Cray at that that early stage. Um, can you tell us uh, throughout those years were there any developments, any results, any things that you say that was quite interesting or that was great? Anything? Yes. Well, I, as I said, that experience, um, you know, and some of it was personal. At, at that point, uh, Seymour Cray was quite active, and I don't think any longer 
any one person could really uh, have the depth and breadth of understanding of a system design that he did. And while he didn't like meetings, we would meet, there were maybe eight to 10 or so of us that would meet with him periodically. And um, he would go toe to toe with each of us, whether it was the person doing the mechanical design, the cooling, the chip design, the memory uh, choices, the the compiler and what its priorities were. And he was able to really go toe to toe with each of us and go as deep <laughs> As, uh, as was necessary. And, and so I, I think that was probably the end of that error, but it, it really gave me um, kind of an understanding of things at a detailed, at a holistic understanding. And I think uh, understanding how your work, no matter how technically deep you are, how it fits in a bitter, bigger landscape, um, I think that, that that really stood out for me as a learning. And so I had the opportunity to um, work on the compiler, to take some risks of my own. I was encouraged to do that. Um, and um, to travel internationally to uh, get a very deep sense of how um, – what the potential was for the work that I was doing. And um, I, I really learned to appreciate that and to realize um, what, a, uh, what a general, um, how generally important that is. And I, um, so, so I was, as I said, I wasn't pushed, but I was encouraged and I was given every opportunity um, even though I, I was the youngest and one of the few females, um, I, I was given really every opportunity to develop. So, so I think that that was really important. I think moving from uh, vectorization, the the compiler was probably the first commercially successful uh, auto paralyzing compiler. Um, and so that was really uh, just a, a wonderful experience because the um, theories and the uh, general approaches about dependency analysis, which underlie the ability to parallelize, were really being developed in academia. And in order to um, implement uh, a, pra a practical computer, you had to uh, keep abreast of that work, but you had to employ a lot of heuristics. So melding a kind of theoretical work with uh, practical heuristics, um, I, I really learned how to do that, and that also became invaluable. Um, besides the vectorization, I think the the broad understanding of parallelism then carried over into the massively parallel systems. And Cray was late to that game, uh, but when it entered, um, I really had the opportunity with the T3D and the T3E um, to uh, a bit come from behind, um, but, um, but be able to be successful. Um, and and again on an international scale, so I, I, it was very it was a very fortunate uh, and long period of time over twenty years. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear, and and I have to say that um, um, the fact that um, the compiler did auto parallelization um, enabled basically any existing uh, Fortran program to run and take advantage of parallelism, which may have been one of the key elements for the big success of the craze at the time. Maybe not touted as such, but the reality that you can run all existing codes and take advantage of parallelism was a fantastic thing that customers love. Is that fair? 
It's it's fair. I would also say, uh, you know, we also had Moore's Law at our back at that point. So uh, it was possible the um, the chip designs were shrinking and one was able to ride that curve. So if you could stay at the forefront, not only could you parallelize and boost the performance by uh, 10 or more times, you you also, uh, even if you didn't parallelize, as long as you stayed on the edge of that curve, you could increase performance even if it didn't parallelize. And that's a, that was a very important uh, attribute um, that uh, it meant that someone could start out faster uh, and only improve over time. There was almost no downside. And, um, and so I would say certainly the, the auto vectorization was, uh, was essential, but we also had other factors in the hardware design that played were more in our favor at that time than than they are say today right now that's very very good to hear um and it was interesting to hear you talk about seymour cray i haven't met him but i heard lots of stories about him and <laughs> <laughs> seymour stories are, are common especially at cray and the fact that he could go toe to toe with anybody fits very well with the things i heard those years you know? <laughs> yes, there's a lot of Seymour Cray stories, and I can't uh, vouch for all of them, but I have my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they become part of the common folklore of of what happens in the industry. So okay. it's very nice to to understand where you were at. Um, I was also involved with a, a Cray T3 operating system at the time, so I lived through that uh, that um, that change that happened, and maybe. You're part of that, and you said we came a bit late to it. But when you look back to the industry, that was an important change. We could say that today's clusters are an evolution of what we're doing at the time. Is that fair, uh, Irene? That's fair. I, I think um, uh, parallelism and the many varied ways to achieve it has been uh, a theme really uh, since then. And I think. Some of us, you and I and, and others, have really um, had a rich career in seeing the varied ways in which that can be approached. So, and it, and it goes on to, till today. Yeah. Okay, so you spent many years at Cray. Um, anything more that you'd highlight yeah. about those years, the experience, perhaps something about the customers, we, some unique customers yeah. that we had? Yeah, I, I I have to say that the relationships that I formed, not only with those I worked with at Cray, um, but we had very close relationships with our customers. And that's not to say that there weren't testy times and there weren't disagreements and arguments, but um, those relationships hold till today. Uh, and um, you know, it it was a, a really unique time, and I would um, I would even say that those relationships formed the foundation for what is the HPC community today. And I do consider it a community. I mean, the community has grown enormously, but uh, it is truly a community. Um, we've we know one another. There's uh, a, a lot of trust. We we can disagree <laughs> and uh, disagree strongly, but um, it, it it is most definitely a community um, and operates as a community. So I, I think that's um, whether I was at Cray, whether I was at Merck, whether I was at NSF or even at Los Alamos. Um, and still, uh, one always uh, brought along uh, those relationships and people would show up in your new world that were members of the community and there was an instant bond. Um, and uh, that bond was, I think, really formed by trying to achieve together 
things that that just were not possible beforehand and things that we couldn't achieve them all but um but we always had ambitious undertakings and that, and that continues today and evolves today maybe you just define high performance computing in that last <laughs> sentence uh, that's quite interesting that's how probably we feel as you said a community of somewhat determined people um, <laughs> but everybody trying to push the boundaries yeah that's right that's Very right. good. Harriet, this is great to hear the time at Cray, and I thought it'd be nice to hear something I personally lo know less about, but um, from Cray, you went to Merck. Um, and um, in, I'm, I'm curious, uh, particular learnings about that transition from a computer vendor to a, an HPC user. What was important at Merck? I mean, um, anything you'd like to share with us? So first of all, I would say that I had actually decided um, after over 20 years that I was going to make a change and a definitive change. And I, um, I had strong affinity with what I would call the application space of high performance computing. And I had seen it in many different ways and many different fields. And um, and so and that was one area I was looking at the the whole area of application. I felt that I wanted to stay in industry for sure. I felt very comfortable in industry, and I liked the focus in industry. I um, I, I just resonated with me at that time, and um, and I the other area I thought about going into was not the application space, um, but was actually going more strongly into IO and data, which is interesting considering what happened and what has happened in that space. Um, and in the end, and I looked at both, and in the end, and, and frankly, I took, uh, I took a, a year to do a distinguished visiting scientist role at NASA uh, Goddard. I was invited there by a colleague uh, uh, who's uh, retired now and a lab fellow, um, Milt Halem, who's a real role model, another real role model for me. Uh, he's currently teaching at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County after retiring as a NASA fellow um, some years back. But he, I, I knew that I didn't want to go into the government, but he asked me to come to NASA Goddard for at least six months, which I did. But in the meantime, I, I, I looked at Merck and a, a several other opportunities in industry. And uh, frankly, what drew me to Merck was that I had seen what had happened uh, to the realm of physics in the 20th century, um, you know, beginning with the theories, Einstein's theories, and, 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 and really the rich role that computation played in the physical sciences during the 20th century, uh, extending into the geosciences and, and climate models and seismic work. Um, and and I thought that uh, the pharmaceutical industry and biology in general was poised uh, in the, this century to make that transition computationally. And so I knew it was early stages, but um, I, I saw an opportunity at Merck uh, that, that I could possibly have uh, a role in that transformation of biochemistry, molecular dynamics uh, in, 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 um, in a transformation that was really based on uh, its computational capabilities. And so that's really why I went. I, things like imagining elimination of uh, animal trials uh, because one could uh, one could deepen the knowledge of um, of 
biological systems and chemical systems uh, within animals so that one could do predictive simulations without actually doing the animal trials, much as what happened in uh, computational fluid dynamics with essentially the replacement of wind tunnels with um, largely replace the wind tunnels with uh, computational models, um, uh, et cetera. So that's why I went. And, um, you know, I think uh, that that still is at the frontiers. Uh, I think much progress has been made. Uh, there was last month the largest um, uh, uh, Molecular dynamic simulation, a billion atoms, uh, happened uh, uh, here at Merck. But the time scales on which that computation operates are still too small. Uh, they're, they're on time scales of a nanosecond or uh, even uh, sometimes achieving uh, a millisecond. But those time scales are, are not yet. Uh, sufficiently long enough uh, to offer the kind of predictive capabilities that one will need to uh, to to really advance the field. So progress is being made, but it's not there yet. But I I really uh, I did enjoy the time at at Merck uh, immensely, and I saw um, the field of genetics uh, start to arise and. Uh, uh, and, and come into its own, um, and that's still progressing. So, so it was really rewarding in that sense. Uh, I would say uh, what really caused me to leave is that I actually missed my own discipline. Uh, I missed the computer science. I missed the that engineering and being part of that directly because all of the work that I was doing at Merck and that my group was doing was really focused so purely on the application space that I missed actually participating in the, more in the computer science realm and, and being a part of that. And so that, that really uh, uh, caused me to turn back into areas that would bring me a little bit closer to uh, the nature of computer science and how it's advancing and computing itself and how it's advancing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing first the reason to go, then the reason to leave, both make sense. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the common thread I'm, I'm seeing in both say, periods of your life were you went in early uh, to the design of computers um, and see the magic progress that happened there. And you probably went in early into the pharma space and saw the beginnings of what's happening now, which will get to yes. you know, a revolution in medicine, right? And now yes. you decided to leave and, and go more to your roots and more to where computer science was happening. And then you went to NSF. And yes. uh, what I understand from your time at NSF is which people may not know that at NSF, you've enabled projects involving scientists from all across the world. And some of them led to breakthrough results. We tend to think about NSF as an American institution. Uh, but it's interesting to be interesting for people to hear a bit about those. So tell us a bit about NSF and about the, the projects that were enabled. So, um, so it, uh, one of the things that I, I did. NSF really focuses on support largely for the academic community. Um, and so um, for me, uh, this was a, a very deep change in that I was not involved in actually doing the work myself. <laughs> I would, and I, it took me more into the both the government side and the academic side. And so I really decided that at, at this point in my career, while I was ready to leave industry, I still was felt 
um, that I wanted to intellectually contribute in. So I looked for more a role that I could be of service to the community that uh, really I had I had participated in and um, and and really felt uh, a deep loyalty to and so I really wanted I really deliberately decided that I wanted to switch more into a service and I knew it would be uh, a bit of a challenge because I'm not an academic and um, even when I was in school, I knew that I, my career would not be as an academic. And, um, and so I knew that I would have to learn a lot because it, it wasn't my area. While I'd interacted with the academics, you know, I, I'd never, you know, I, I'd not really operated strictly in that role, in that, in that area. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say that is really important for those of us who over have had these really wonderful uh, careers that, you know, just have had opportunities that I think from a timing perspective, yes, one has to be ready, but timing is, is really important. And we happen to fall into a time and had sufficient skills to be able to have this ability to participate, I think um, recognizing at this stage when our responsibilities, our children may be grown, we don't have such financial responsibilities, that we actually can take risks and take different risks than we could earlier in our career. And, and, and that risk can allow us to give back um, to that community. And so that was really the thinking about um, going to NSF. And I found it to be a, um, a quite uh, uh, really rich environment. Um, I had to learn a lot, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, it took me again to that mediation between where the technology is going and what are the frontiers of various scientific disciplines and how do those frontiers interact with one another and how do they, um, how, how do they, uh, how can they use emergent technologies? And so, uh, you know, really I it was it was quite a rich space, and I would say, in terms of what new advances occurred, um, I didn't do any of those advances. <laughs> so you know, of none of it was was me. Uh, you know, the, it was really both uh, uh, trying to support researchers who were really doing those advances and support uh, universities who were uh, trying to do innovative approaches to computing, uh, to supportive computing, uh, uh, building a national infrastructure that could support that and in, in, in international collaborations. So it was, it was really their successes. I, I can't really, lay any claim uh, to them myself. But nonetheless, um, it was very enriching. And I did have that opportunity again, as I had at Cray, to see, um, you know, particularly at the computing centers that NSF supports, uh, to see researchers uh, begin to explore, um, again, molecular dynamics. Uh, for example, um, Klaus Schulten, who's now deceased, and his team at the University of Illinois uh, looked at um, constructing uh, a simulation of the HIV capsid, the hard shell that surrounds the virus 
the HIV virus and protects it, um, the HIV virus from drugs and from other things that would attempt to uh, to uh, uh, rid the body of the virus. And so he the, he constructed the first uh, 64 million atom uh, capsid shell showing its structure and showing where ion channels might be present so that drugs could be targeted to penetrate through that ion channel into the virus. And, you know, so those are real, those are real breakthroughs. Other groups were um, uh, looking to, uh, uh, on the NSF machines as well as others, we're looking to detect uh, uh, gravitational waves to, to search for evidence of gravitational waves from examination of the data coming off of inter interferometers, um, again, worldwide, and, um, and, and being able to match what they saw in that data with, again, simulations of black holes colliding, for example. And again, this is none of the work that I did, but I played a small piece by supporting others um, as, as they tried to do these simulations, as they tried to uh, produce software and uh, acquire systems that would allow that analysis to be done. That is very good to hear. And I think, Irene, you mentioned that you had a motivation for service. And I would say a good leader uh, focuses on service. And that's what he did those years at NFS. And I've heard you before talk about a few of these projects, like the Black Holes Colliding uh, Project on Seismic and Arctic Project. And your passion came through the fact that you didn't do them. Uh, you didn't do the project yourself. The fact that you were part of the team that enabled them um, was just wonderful to hear. So I want to share that. Yeah, well, thank you. I was, it's a privilege really um, to be able to help in whatever way uh, one can. And, and just to see those, uh, those achievements up close. Yeah, very good. So Irene, you, uh, you've been a very successful leaders, a leader in all these spaces. Um, in, so I, I'm, I'm reflecting on the fact that very different stages, very different environments, um, you, you've achieved in all of them. Um, and I wonder, you, you gave a few tips here and there um, for new people coming along. But I wonder if there's something you'd like to share, any, any particular things you'd like to share for um, people coming along, the next generation of leaders coming behind you. So um, a couple of things I would uh, say, and, and these may sound uh, trite, but uh, I think they're true nonetheless. One of the, at, at moments at, um, at Cray that I can think of, and here at Los Alamos, um, some of the most um, profound advances that I've seen come from groups of people that have very different perspectives, very different ideas. And so um, I, I'm really a firm believer in in diversity and diversity in all its aspects. And by that, I mean ways of thinking, uh, very different perspectives. And you only get that diversity if you're bringing people in from different backgrounds, from different cultures that really can represent, you know, quite unique ways of looking at things. And, and frankly, multi-generational. You need early career, mid-career, um, as well as uh, uh, 
more mature uh, career people, in order to get that mix of ideas that really advances um, either technologies or fields. And one can see that happening in uh, areas such as quantum research, where one is trying to um, mix uh, different uh, disciplines. Uh, one is in training a, a new generation. Um, and that that being able to work in the environment and frankly being able to lead uh, so that one is able to have different points of view, disagree, but then uh, use those to uh, take a field in a different direction, in a direction that no one person could do on their own. That's really the name of the game in so many areas now. And so I, I really, um, we need this next generation to be as diverse <laughs> as we can make it. We need all of us. And that means, you know, both in the U.S., but it also means internationally. Um, and so I, I'm really a firm believer in that. And um, and so I, those are words that I would, you know, we have to struggle to uh, collectively uh, bring our different disciplines, our different perspectives uh, on the world's hardest problems and the most challenging problems. It's great to hear. Diversity is what's going to help us continue to innovate, come up with new ideas, collaborate in a good way. So um, it, it's great to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, it's a rare opportunity uh, to be able to interview you. So I want to thank you on behalf of, of our audience. Um, before we close, uh, I wonder if there's something else, anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, I, I don't know that I'd like to add anything else, but I want to thank you, Gabriel, for um, reaching out. Um, it's, uh, it's really a sign of this community that one can, uh, see someone after 10 years, after 20 years, and that bond is <laughs> instantly there. So uh, I want to thank you for uh, doing the work you do and, 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 for, uh, and for talking with me. Thank you, Irene. It's, it's a pleasure to reconnect with you. Uh, it's been good years, whenever, 20 years ago, but that's going to date us a little. <laughs> uh, but it's always great to connect, to listen to you, hear you two, two stages after that, and hear your experience in, in, in the other um, opportunities you've had. So thanks again. And uh, in closing, I'd like to thank our guest, Irene Qualters, leader in HPC, for giving us the opportunity to pick into her career, her learnings, her thoughts and help us pass a bit of Irene to the next generation of leaders. Till next time, Thanks. I am Gabriel Bronner and this is the Big Compute Podcast. Thanks, Gabriel.